Hello and welcome, my friends and viewers, to this week's episode of Legend Lore, where I draw and talk about monsters, characters, gods, and other things from D&D 5th Edition, all while giving a small but quickly digestible history about them. Together we'll go over their history within the game, how they utilize in the modern edition, and how you guys can utilize them in your own games. This week, we're going to be covering the Red Knight, a goddess of strategy, tactical warfare, and battle, as well as the once divine servant of the god Tempest, who we've also covered in a previous Legend Lore video linked in the description below. Getting right into it, the Red Knight first appeared in 2nd edition D&D as a demigod, depicted as a warrior garbed wholly in blood-red plate mail armor, with a stream of black hair flowing behind her, as well as a pair of gleaming ruby-red eyes peeking from the shadows of her helm. Nope, despite her intimidating appearance, she was known to be extremely meticulous, calm, and logical, appreciating dedication and loyalty over dishonesty and fickleness. She was also known to apparently enjoy good jokes, and had a healthy respect for humor and compassion on the battlefield. Being one of the only gods that didn't have a true name that was known, many believe that she kept it secret so as to prevent her enemies from getting any insight into her strengths or weaknesses, and others say that discovering her name would allow one to have knowledge of any and all strategy and war plans made throughout the material realm, the truth of which is subjected from DM to DM. While she started as a demigoddess, the Red Knight's loyalty has always been to Tempest, the god of war, with her serving under him eons before he elevated her to full deific status. This was done in order to balance out the domain of war, as the Red Knight's penchant for strategy and compassion on the battlefield did very well to temper the power of the god Garagos, whose domains focused on the brutal and destructive aspect of war. In terms of rites, rituals, and the Church of the Red Knight, the Red Fellowship, as they call themselves, is a small but incredibly dedicated collection of clerics, paladins, monks, and specialized priests known as Holy Strategists. Most, if not all, of these worshippers served in the military as high commanders, quartermasters, or even as drill sergeants and instructors at war and combat academies. Paladins who further devoted themselves to the Red Knight could become members of the Holy Order of the Red Falcon, which could be very interesting for your Paladin players. The Red Fellowship is also one of the few religions that has an established holy book, known as the Master Tactician, which is often used as a teaching tool in both the art of war and ways to use the Red Knight's secret divine magic. The hierarchy of the Red Knight's Church often operated much like military ranking, with acolytes starting as squires before rising to become knights, knight captains, lord knights, and eventually the high priest title of Lord or Lady Knight of the Red Standard, which is the highest position that you can gain in the order. An interesting aspect of the church is that the priesthood, while off duty, were often fans of games that required strategic thought to win, especially games such as lance board or chess, which was favored to the point that temples of the Red Knight frequently featured chess iconography and housed defensive constructs built to represent actual chess pieces, which I find very fascinating flavor-wise. The clergy paid no mind to games of chance, however, due to the reliance on Tamora, the goddess of fortune, but games of both strategy and skill were heavily favored amongst them, almost to the point of goading competition. The Red Church would often work frequently with other churches, primarily those of the gods Torm, Tyr, Valkur, and their own parent church of Tempest. Meanwhile, clerics of Garagos were often avoided and sometimes directly combated against, and those who worshipped the god Siric were heavily despised. The ceremonial and holy vestments of the Red Knight included red enameled plate, pure white tabards bearing the goddess's holy symbol, and a heavily ornamented full-face helmet that obscured the face of the wearer, so as to emulate the form of the goddess herself while still allowing the worshipper to customize their own aesthetic. This is also in direct opposition to the clergy of Tempest, who were forbidden to obscure their face from their enemies. Rituals and holidays to the Red Knight included the Retreat and the Queen's Gambit. The Retreat was a solemn ceremony focused predominantly on assembly and reflection, with the clergy discussing previous year's campaigns, strategies, battles, and accumulated knowledge that would then be integrated into the church's future teachings. The Queen's Gambit, however, was a much more lighthearted affair, a day-long extravaganza full of feasting, gaming, tournaments, chess, and competitions of athletic ability such as jousting and sword fighting. Victors would receive titles of merit, recognition, promotions, and even gifts from the temple's very armory. This could be a very interesting way for you to introduce a magic item to your players without forcing them to go through a combat or slog through a dungeon. In terms of the Red Knight's relationship with other gods and entities, Tempest stands out as being the most venerated of the Red Knight, with her seeing him as a father figure and a mentor, often spending time hunting and training and simply telling stories within their own halls. It is also said that Tempest is the only person who knows the Red Knight's true name. The Red Knight is also keen to form allyships with other gods, such as the previously mentioned Falkor, god of the sailors, who would provide aid in naval conflicts, and Torm, who helped teach and temper the goddess's thirst for war in her youth, guiding her more so to the ways of justice, honor, and compassion. Some believe there is a romantic connection between the two, but again, that's up for you to decide for your world. I personally don't really see it to be useful. In terms of her foes, the Red Knight saved almost all of her animosity for Siric, the god of lies, who also has a video that is also linked in the description. His penchant for treachery, impulsiveness, and poor planning caused her to view him as inefficient and frankly pathetic, but the butterfly effects of his carelessness and the way that it could harm others was what really earned her disdain. Ironically, despite serving as Tempest's balancing weight against Garagos, the Red Knight does not outright dislike him, despite his own resentment for her. 
Garagos's erratic approach to warfare always meant that a contest between them would end in her favor, and she would see him more as a necessary evil than an actual threat. When it comes to my table, I personally have not had the chance to actually have the Red Knight make an appearance, but I have developed how I would portray her when the time does come. For the players who wish to worship her directly, I would paint her as a warrior keen to pass her knowledge upon her pupils, always present to support them, but distant enough that they will have to learn to fight their own battles and grow strong by themselves. She'll always suggest diplomacy and bloodless avenues of negotiation, but is not above having to go to war and draw her sword against her enemies. Yet she still teaches honor, compassion, and props her faithful to allow the collection of the dead, the taking of prisoners, the exchanging them for ransom, and treating them as people despite their place as the enemy. Finding common ground and avoiding cruelty are often the best foundations for peace after all. All of her aspects, history and clerical rites and such, I would keep. I think her flavor, depiction, and place as a goddess is excellent for any player and for the story that I'm attempting to tell with my world. Furthermore, I have developed a homebrew order of Valkyrie-like knights who serve the Red Knight, known as the Order of Restoration. This organization is dedicated to providing aid, comfort, counseling, and protection for victims of abuse or trauma, be it domestic or foreign, aiding them to navigate their own personal battles or face their inner demons. This order believes that warriors and knights should not be the only people to receive the Red Knight's blessing, and war on the battlefield is not the only war that there is. As such, I believe the Red Knight would understand this and build an avenue for her worshippers to help in this regard, and many of the people that they do help end up returning to become members of the organization so they may pass their knowledge and aid along. I do still keep the Order of the Red Falcon in my world, as well as the Fellowship, but this is just my own personal touch and something that many of my players have expressed interest in, but unfortunately have not pursued. In terms of classes that I like to align with the Red Knight, Artificers of all sorts make excellent Quartermasters and Smith for the Red Knight, and almost all subclasses of the Fighter, Paladin, Ranger, and Monk can fit with each different martial archetype being the character's chosen approach to combat. It's the strategy that they pick to implement in battle when they're facing their adventures. Barbarians, while more in line with gods like Tempest or Garagos due to their chaotic approach to the battle, can adopt the mechanic of rage being less foaming at the mouth head on charge and more of a concentrated intense focus or a killing calm. Bards of the Valor and Swords Colleges can make great warriors as well as storytellers, writing sagas and songs about their own exploits and those of their allies for history to remember. Clerics of Peace, War, Life, Light, Knowledge, and Forge domains can all fit into different parts of the Red Knight's religious hierarchy, and Divine Soul Sorcerers of Law fit very, very well, as well as Clockwork Soul due to its focus on balance and order, but you may need to flavor that a little bit to lessen its reliance on the plane of Mechanus. Celestial and Hexblade Warlocks would be a very interesting character concept due to the Warlock's place as a direct agent of their patron, and the Red Knight being a goddess of strategy. And then finally we have Divination, Abjuration, Enchantment, Blade Singing, and War Magic Wizards, all of which fit right into the Red Knight's idea of being the intellectual warrior. Above all, the Red Knight as a god focuses on the use of strategy, intelligence, and tactics to achieve victory, and your character can absolutely embody these beliefs no matter which class they choose. These are just the ones that I personally like to align directly with them. For characters and quests for this video, I decided to take a different approach, and instead of creating my own NPCs, to actually go deeper into the lore of old Dungeons and Dragons and pick out some ones that have already been established, but have unfortunately not been emphasized or focused on in the new 5th edition. First of all, we have Kandera Steel Dice, a paladin sworn to the Red Knight and a leader of the Gold Swords Mercenary Company. Known mostly for spreading the word of the Red Knight through various continental military campaigns, not much else is known about Kandera beyond the fact that she once held the favor and admiration of a pharaoh and aided a struggling nation by convincing its counselors to change the law so that both men and women could work equal jobs, thus keeping the commerce afloat and avoiding economic collapse. As such, Kandera could serve as an interesting NPC for your players to meet, a potent mixture of egalitarian diplomat and cunning warrior keen to solve the problems of others and build positive relationships with people, whilst also serving her goddess. The PCs can meet her as a driving force for good and prosperity wherever there is corruption or distinct hardship, and she could even serve as a quest giver for them to aid in her good deeds. She could even eventually give them a place within her mercenary company, which can see them meeting a variety of colorful characters. And next we have Caitlin Tyndall Bloodhawk, the first Lady Knight of the Red Standard and a big player when it comes to things having to do with the Red Knight. Caitlin was, or is depending on your timeline, the leader of the adventuring band turned clerical order, the Order of the Red Falcon. Yes, she is the highest of high priests that you guys can encounter when regards to the Red Knight, so much so that she one time became the avatar of the goddess and led her empowered armies against an invading host of monsters, saving the Faerunian kingdom of Tethyr and earning glory for her and her loyal legion of paladins and fighters. Their temple, known ostentatiously as the Citadel of Strategic Militancy, resides just north of the great city of Baldur's Gate. But again, that information is only really useful if you're explicitly running the game in the Forgotten Realms. Caitlin Bloodhawk is a very different sort of person than Gendera, standing more as a shining sword of the Red Knight than a weaver of commerce. She leads her armies wherever the goddess deems them needed, often to places with lacking defenses or those who have little hope to survive an onslaught from many enemies at all sides. As such, your players can provide aid to her armies in the middle of a skirmish, or even witness her transform into the avatar of the goddess herself should one of your players be among the Red Knight's worshippers. 
But regardless of what you choose, she always serves as a leader of the Red Falcon Order and will no doubt provide gratitude and support for the adventurers who fight alongside her and her armies towards their noble goals. Likewise, you can even have the party meet her prior to her ascension, serving as a squire or a low-ranking official who bears great dreams of one day leading her order as a paladin. It's always good when your players help NPCs realize their dreams. And then lastly, instead of an NPC, we have an encounter for this video, which is focused mostly on the idea of the Queen's Gambit holiday. The party can walk into a town or a city and catch the celebration up in full swing, allowing them to engage in several skill check filled competitions for gold and glory. It's a good excuse for some easy downtime while also allowing them to build relationships with the common people, gain some notoriety, be seen by people in power, and learn more about the worship and rights of the Red Knight herself. It's also just a good general holiday to introduce your players to a new city or town if you're looking to begin on a positive note. And as I previously said, if your players win these competitions, they could get access to a very interesting magic item from the Red Knight's holdings. Some magic items that I can see being aligned with the Red Knight include all manner of plus one to plus three weapons, armor, and shields, as well as sentinel shields for advantage on initiative checks, boots of false tracks to use in outsmarting your enemies, orbs of shielding, headbands of intellect, armor of etherealness, defending weapons, staffs of striking, spell guard shields, rods of absorption, and of course the good old Holy Avenger. Basically any item that gives the party advantages and or insight into the enemy's plans are all wonderful boons that she would give them. But be sure to avoid items that have to do with chance or luck such as luck blades and the like. And finally, for a homebrew magic item this evening, we have the Amaranth Banner, now with some art. This plus one pike with a standard depicting the Red Knight's holy symbol attached to it requires attunement and can only be wielded by a paladin, fighter, or a cleric of good alignment. While it is bared, the wielder can cast a spell Bless at will, and it affects a number of creatures equal to your proficiency bonus rather than the normal three. Additionally, the wielder can slam the banner into the ground once per short rest and call out a battle cry. All allies within 60 feet of the wielder that can hear the cry heal a number of hit points equal to 1d10 plus their level and have advantage on their next attack roll. This banner item is meant to provide powerful attack support and is best in the hands of a cleric, fighter, or paladin who is often in the thick of the battle alongside their comrades. I've included the item stat block in the description below as well as some nice art to finally go with it. And that's the Red Knight, everybody. Thank you guys so much for watching, and if you guys enjoyed the video, please like, share, subscribe, and press the little bell icon to be notified when a new one comes out. And comment down below how you guys have encountered or used the Red Knight in your games and what you would change compared to my own version. If you guys want to vote in the next video, please check out the link in the description to decide which monster I shall cover this week, choosing between the Roper, the Bodak, and the Catablevas. And also, let me know what kind of things you guys would like to see in future videos. But until then, I'll see you guys next time.